Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Library Advisory Commission meeting for July 20th, 2020. As an attendee, this meeting is being recorded and streamed live to YouTube. Your microphone is muted for the entire presentation. We are not taking open mic comments. However, you do not need a microphone, camera, or a screen if you only want to listen to the meeting, as this meeting is accessible by landline or mobile phone. If you need assistance, please call the library's telephone information line at 1-831-427-7713. To join this webinar using a telephone only, please dial any of the following numbers. I'll read a couple of them aloud. 1-833-548-0000. Or 1-877-853-5247 and then slowly enter the webinar ID of 918-5602-7487. The Commission will take public comments as outlined in the posted agenda and in the next slides. All comments must include the agenda item number and be received prior to the close of public comment on that agenda item. If you're joining by computer, you may also use the Q&A feature to type in your comment. On the attendee control bar, you'll see the Q&A icon. In the lower left corner, you'll see audio settings, then that Q&A icon, and then leave meeting in red letters. If you're on a mobile device, the Q&A icon may appear near the top of your screen. In the upper left corner, you'll see leave meeting in red letters, the meeting ID, the Q&A icon over near the right hand side, and then you may see more with the three dots. Alternatively, you may also call the library's telephone information line to timely submit your comments at 831-427-7713. These will be read by the moderator. Once the commission begins, if you're joining by a computer to see all panelists, you may need to use the Zoom control bar and select gallery view. Depending on the size of your mobile device screen, you may need to scroll over to view whomever is speaking. And if you're accessing this meeting via the web browser only, you will not see all panelists at one time, only the panelists speaking. The chair of the commission, Bob White, will now call the meeting to order. We are transitioning to gallery view. Please stand by. Over to you, Bob. And Bob, we can't hear you. You'll need to unmute your line. There we go. Sorry. Um, so let me start again. <laughs> Thank you, Moderator Jones. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the July 20th 2020 meeting of the Library Advisory Commission. I'm Bob White, Chair of the Library Advisory Commission, and uh, I'm now calling the July 20th meeting of the Library Advisory Commission to order. I'm asking Clerk Simano Vargas to please read the roll call. Lindsay Bass. Here. Bruce Cotter. Here. Rena Dubin. Here. Jim Landreth. Here. Mary Ripma. Here. Bob White. Here. And Trisha Wynn. Here. Great. We have a quorum, which is always a good thing. Um, next is the adoption of the agenda. And uh, do we have a motion to adopt this evening's agenda? I move adopting the agenda. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second it. it seconded. Um, Clerk Simona Vargas, please read the roll call for a roll call vote. Lindsay Bass. Yay. Bruce Cotter. Aye. Rena Dubin. Aye. Jim Landreth. Aye. Mary Ritma. Aye. Bob White. Aye. And Trisha Wynn. Aye. Okay, the, the agenda is adopted. Um, 
Next is oral communications. And uh, let me read this first. Any member of the audience and the public may address the board on any matter either on or off the agenda that is within the board's jurisdiction. Moderator Jones, do we have any general pu public comments or communications at this time? Chair White, there are no public comments at this time. Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the report by our library director, Susan Nimitz, and that can be found on pages uh, three through seven in your agenda packet. Susan? I briefly wanted to address the library budget first because I know several of you had questions about it last time we met. The library joint powers board did approve the budget that we recommended in June um, with the recognition that we would come back in September with, um, uh, with a review of that budget. We were supposed to get some updates on revenue projections, but we did not get them as of this week. We're hoping to have them by next week. Um, so we really aren't in a position to be able to tell you um, what's going to happen next. I think we can all predict that the original budget assumptions were based on um, the, the thought that the first wave would be over by now. So I suspect that they'll be uh, regu relatively negatively. Once we have a budget target, we'll begin conversations with staff. Um, we have been looking really closely um, at our budget and trying to find additional non-personnel savings. But in terms of personnel, um, we started this journey with about 100 full-time equivalent staff and about 26 full-time equivalent temporaries. All the 26 temporary staff are gone. It was actually 62 people making up um, 26 full-time people. Um, we have lost 10% of the remaining staff through furloughs, and each of the staff members took a 10% cut. So that puts us at about 90 FDE. Um, and we are holding about 10 positions open through the hiring freeze, which puts us at about 80 FTE. Um, I just got the announcement on my telephone that all the public schools in Santa Cruz County are going to go virtual in the fall. Um, that means that the COVID numbers are going the wrong direction, um, which is going to put some further um, pressure on our staffing levels because we have a lot of staff with small children that will need to figure out childcare. So if you think about it as 126 full-time equivalents, we're down to uh, 80 and um, heading south. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, I think we'll go after the non-personnel budget first in our next round of budget reductions, um, but I remain really concerned about the budget. I guess I did wanna talk briefly about COVID. Um, but Santa Cruz County remains actually in a relatively positive position compared to the rest of the state of California. But if you look at all of the surrounding counties, including the counties to the south, um, they're in what's now the red zone. And um, the county health officer expects us to be in that red zone within the next two weeks. Um, again, I think if you look closely at the numbers, we're having significant increases in cases um, thankfully, we aren't having significant uh, increases in, in deaths, but our hospitalization and respirator use is going up. Um, and so one of the things we're really trying to do is be agile enough to sort of expand services and contract services uh, over the next year as needed um, based upon the health issues that the region is facing. Um, Eric, I just wanted to talk about some of the great things we've been doing. Um, do you mind just talking about how the last, I think you haven't seen us in probably six to eight weeks and some of the things we've been working on and how's it going? Sure, um, thank you. I, I, I do wanna talk about the positive things. It just, um, 
you know, we, we pride ourselves in being able to, to respond to the informational needs and um, the vast needs of the community. And so just as the needs are growing um, so dramatically, um, we're also struggling with these, um, these, these new staffing levels. Um, and we're strained also because the work that we are doing, for instance, curbside, which is a, a really phenomenal pivot, I believe, on the library's part. Um, many of you know that we, um, after we, we reopened in first to three locations, um, and then we first spent the, the first two weeks sending out the books that um, patrons had requested, um, we learned from that model and then we were able to expand. So we, we opened up curbside then at Felton and Live Oak um, and they are proving to be very popular. But when we do all of this, it's, it's, it's really brand new to us as well. We're, we're operating with masks. We're making sure that we're working six feet away. We're quarantining um, our materials for 72 hours based on um, best practices. Um, which is really presented to us both from the state library, but also from our national association. Um, that slows down the work that we do, obviously, if we have to quarantine material. Um, and then too, if you think about the work that the patron did when they came into the library and browsed and then picked up an item, we're now doing all of the work of that patron, right? Because we're now we're, we're, we're picking up the book for the patron and we're sending it to them. So our labor, had, our labor demands have gone up um, while our staffing levels have gone down. So um, really it speaks highly to the staff who have um, adapted so quickly to this and uh, made this big pivot. Um, so I think that's the biggest news is that we have now two new locations added to our curbside. Um, so we have five altogether. Again, those are downtown, um, Aptos, um, Scotts Valley, Felton and Live Oak. Um, and then we were um, putting together plans for taking us to that next stage. And if you, if you recall, in one of our meetings, we went over um, a number of stages that would, uh, we would take our library through um, to, to that time that we're all looking forward to when we can reopen the doors. Um, and we always threw out the caveat that we would have to create a model that allows us to retreat if necessary and um, that's kind of where we're starting to, to we're beginning to look at that not necessarily retreating from these five locations but we were on the cusp of looking at expanding these services and we're still thinking of innovative ways to do that but it's going to look different than what we originally imagined even just a few weeks ago um, because of these new numbers in addition to that um, we continue to provide services um, to the county jail facilities um, we do distance learning with them. We still provide um, items to those locations. Um, we have also um, re we received a, a grant um, from the state to partner with the schools during the summer that continue to provide school lunches to children. And we work with um, over 600 families, providing them with books and STEAM kits that our staff create um, and distribute. Uh, we have a really large range of programming that we do, including summer reading, which went entirely uh, online. It's completely virtual. Our staff had to renegotiate contracts so that we had um, performers who um, were then doing the work um, virtually. Um, so we have close to a thousand participants in that program, which I think still speaks really highly of what the staff is able to provide um, the, the community, even virtually. And as I said at the beginning, we're really all the time trying to assess these new needs that our community has. And so our virtual programming reflects that. Um, we have really robust conversations, honest, respectful conversations with the community um, through community conversations, which is a program that we had before um, we, we went virtual and it's continued to be very successful virtually um, so that we, we dive into um, really some of these critical issues um, around equity, around policing, around COVID um, that is continued to, to be supported virtually through um, our Zoom programming, which is also something that our staff has had to figure out how to do, just as we're doing right now, is how do you run a proper program and continue to engage people virtually? And we're, we're learning every day about this experience and, and um, our staff, I think, are doing a really amazing job at it. And those programs have um, really run the gamut from um, 
a series that we kicked off and now um, the Friends of the Library is also supporting in their own way called Community Resilience. Um, we're looking at all different aspects of, of how a community can grow stronger um, after a, a challenging time like the one we're in right now. Um, we've looked at homelessness um, in, through that prism as well and also how that affects um, the health. Um, how do all these policies kind of um, inter interact with one another and, and cross over? Um, so we've had, we continue to do virtual programming. We're also, we also introduced in this quarter, um, Spanish um, virtual um, programming for children and families. And um, we continue to run um, regular story time programs and, and these programs are, are very successful. Um, mm -hmm. At the most, we'll have a, a couple hundred people at once. And then the other thing that's kind of unique about doing programming like this is it's recorded oftentimes, not always, but, but a lot of our programming is. So even though we may have a couple hundred people at one program, unlike our previous programs, um, they're now available to anybody in the world um, to, to participate in and, and we're, we see those numbers as well um, continue to go up. I know I'm leaving out a lot, but I just wanted to give you a quick thumbnail sketch of, of, of some of the things that we're doing right now. Right. So, so um, we're going to talk about where we're going to go next and, and um, present some ideas to you. But I was just curious if you had any comments or questions. I also put a, a FAQ we put together um, for our website so you can see some of the basic questions people are asking. Um, did you have any questions? Trisha. Um, don't have a question so much as have a com I have, have three quick comments. Um, one, I really want to commend you for all the virtual programming uh, that you're doing. You know, every year my little Aptos friends group raises money for summer reading. And, you know, sometimes there are 12 kids, so, you know, occasionally there are six kids. You know, they're having hundreds of kids attend these programs this year. So you, you're doing something right. And I really want to commend you for that. I'm also taking advantage of curbside at Aptos branch. Just couldn't be easier. You know, you get a ding on your phone, your book's there, you, you go to the library, you call them, you say you're there and you just go and pick it up. I mean, it's just, it's crowded, lots of people there, which is great, but um, really it's just working out so beautifully. And uh, really, I wanna commend you so much for going to those school sites where kids are picking up their lunches. When I read through the packet, I just, I mean, I almost, wept. I'm so happy you're doing that. Those kids are so disadvantaged right now and their worlds are so affected by this and I'm really glad they can still get a library book. So thank you for that. I um, just want to say someone forwarded a little yellow note that someone had written on a post-it on a book. Um, but I think there's so many adults in our community that are really, really isolated and um, it was just a lovely note about how important having the library and the library gang back was to this patron in terms of getting them through this really difficult period of isolation. And um, again, I, I think we are uh, an important part of the community. Um, I, I know we do it on the big days when there are a lot of people in the building, but it's nice that people feel a part of this still under these circumstances. Thank you, Tricia. Yeah, thank you very much. Heather P, who is our branch manager at Aptos, all the branch managers um, have worked amazingly well together to try to figure out how do we create an efficient system that also protects staff and, and our community, and, and, and they've really pulled it off. Um, so we do, we do really have an amazing staff. Thank you. Great. So any additional questions for Susan or for, for Eric? Yeah. Uh, Moderator Jones, are there any comments from the public on any item on the library director's report? Yes, Chair White, we do have one for agenda item four, which is our current agenda item. It says there is an error in the library director's report on library facilities found on page 14 of the agenda packet. In her report on the downtown branch, she states in part, quote, Downtown Group 4 completed a cost assessment and preliminary design of the downtown library as part of a mixed-use project within the existing $27 million budget. 
Findings were presented to the City Council on June 23, 2020. The Council conceptually approved relocating the downtown branch to the ground level of a mixed-use project on Lot 4 to include at least 50 affordable housing units and a parking garage, end quote. The motion passed by the City Council was to include a minimum of 50, quote-unquote, low-income housing units, not, quote-unquote, affordable units. There is a big difference between the two. Low income has a specific definition provided by the federal government's Housing and Urban Development Agency. The income level for low income is very different and much less than that of a, quote, affordable unit. And I'd, I'd be happy to let the um, minutes reflect that change. Um, it's actually under the general business item B library facilities. So, so Yvonne, if you could make that change to the report. And there is another that. comment. I th is there one other comment? And one to be honest, these are for agenda item 7B. Um, so I don't know if we want to wait till then. Yes, let's wait until that we get to that agenda item. Clerk um, Yvonne, it is noted in the Q&A that these are for agenda item 4. So as um, Director Nemitz implied, let's just note the minutes, please. Is, is there one more comment, though, regarding agenda item four? It is, but Director Nemitz said that it is still pertaining to number seven. So right. perhaps it was just written in error. Okay. Director Nemitz, is that correct? That's my understanding. It's around the, the facilities projects for downtown. Okay. So we'll hold them until seven. All right. That sounds fine. Um, I, I wanted to just mention that the comment is specifically talking about what's on page four of the packet that that that's what needs to be changed and so i will if that's what needs to be changed in the packet i can change that language if need be and it's on page 14 which is part of this agenda item yes it's part of your director's report page 14 oh you're right never mind library facilities Sorry, it's under general business. All right, so, so we'll address that under general business. Okay, great. Uh, so any additional questions for Susan or Eric? Hearing none, we're on to... Um, I, I, yes, Rena? Oh, I, I just did want to say thank you very much for um, everything that you've been doing. I know it's tremendous and any way we can show appreciation to the staff, uh, we would be happy to do that as a commission. As for me as a commissioner, maybe, I don't know if there's something we can do as a commission to just say thank you. Um, I don't know if there's any protocol, but I think they're definitely going above and beyond, so. It might be time for a pizza party. <laughs> can we do that in COVID? I don't even know if we can do that in COVID. Sorry, bad idea. Yeah, we've been trying to avoid that, but um, <laughs> um, I mean, I, you know, it does mean a lot uh, for when you go to the curbside and, and you just express your appreciation to them. Um, that's always a huge boost in morale. I think they really love seeing the customers. Yeah. And we'll be talking more about library services under uh, number si under general business under library operational recommendations. So, um, so I think we're done with this agenda item. Um, so we'll on we're on to member reports. And we were thinking since we have four new commissioners joining the joining the library advisory commission this year we thought that it would be helpful for not only new members, but also continuing members to introduce themselves. And uh, this is actually also, uh, we received a public comment after the last meeting su suggesting this, that this would, would be a good idea for us to introduce ourselves. So <clears throat> I will go through the roster and ask each of you to briefly introduce yourself. And uh, I will go last. So, um, so let me ask, uh, start with, with Rena. 
Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hopefully my uh, everything is stable and you can hear me okay. But um, I am a homeschooling mom and I have uh, two teenagers and one who hopefully will be going on to UC Santa Barbara this fall. We'll see how everything goes. Um, but I've been in the county for over 30 years and just use the library personally and also for my kids homeschooling and uh, as a homeschool teacher and homeschool consultant, uh, just a very high volume library user throughout all the branches in the county. So um, I'm really just pleased to be able to offer whatever advice I can here. Great, thank you. Um, next is Mary, Mary Ritma. Hi, um, I <clears throat> have a little speech that I'll try not to read here, but I relocated to the Bay Area in 1976 to attend San Jose State University for my master's in library science. Santa Cruz was one of the first places I visited 44 years ago, and I'm really grateful to be able to call Santa Cruz home now and to serve on the uh, Libraries Advisory Commission. I've always loved libraries, and I do believe they're a cornerstone of community, and my career has revolved around them. I've been involved in libraries and library-related publishing, and I hope that my work experience can contribute to our community. My paid employment has been in academic, public, and government libraries. As a card catalog technician, do you remember card catalogs? I used to actually make the cards. Um, reference librarian and circulation desk supervisor. Just after library school, I directed publishing operations for a magazine indexing firms, firm that sold products to libraries. And later I worked in a call center at Dialog, some might remember, to answer librarians' questions about database searching. And recently I worked up at campus at UCSC at the circulation desk at McHenry M. Science Library. So I'm a member of the PVQA, our local quilt guild. And as another way of contributing to community, I have been sewing face masks and isolation gowns. So I'm currently reading uh, The Yellow House, which is a little more serious uh, reading than uh, just before that. I, I'd recommend Belgravia by Fellows, the guy who wrote uh, Downton Abbey. And I also used RB Digital to listen to all seven of the Harry Potter uh, books while I was cooking in the kitchen. Is there any questions? I, I think that's great. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, Jim, you'd like to tell us about yourself? As soon as I unmute. Okay. <laughs> Um, I moved to Scotts Valley about six years ago. Um, my wife got very involved with uh, the Friends of the Library, and uh, that's how I got drafted to represent Scotts Valley uh, on the commission. Uh, I bring kind of diversity because I don't have any library background. I've always been humbled by all of you folk who, who have this great knowledge in that. Hopefully I can offer some outside input, but um, I, I work still remotely for the company that I worked for before we moved from Wisconsin. It's a low income, um, affordable um, housing provider in the, throughout the state of Wisconsin. And um, I still work for them part time. I've got degrees in architecture and finance. Uh, I worked in construction for quite a bit of time. I uh, also, interestingly, owned a small ski area in Wisconsin for 14 years, so I've got kind of a diverse background and uh, willing to fit in wherever I can. Great. Thank you. Next, uh, Lindsay, you want to tell us about yourself? Hi, everybody. Lindsay Bass. Um, I have been a Santa Cruz resident on and off since the mid-90s. Um, I moved out to Santa Cruz from Indiana to pursue a marine science degree from UC Santa Cruz. So 
I spent many a night, many a late night in um, the science library <laughs> up on the city on a hill um, and have always been uh, drawn to knowledge and the pursuit of continued learning. Um, I got a degree, a master's in environmental science and management, worked for an international environmental nonprofit for the past 10 years, um, and uh, recently uh, took a position with the City of Santa Cruz in the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, so I am kind of in Jim's camp as well. So I am in awe of the folks that have been immersed and stooped in library science and library services. I'm looking to learn a lot from you all and hoping to bring my skill set in um, grant writing, fundraising, um, group facilitation, um, community engagement, and tables to help wherever those um, can be helpful, but also to fully represent District 1, which is the Live Oak area um, of the county um, here on the commission. And um, most recently, I finished um, a book called Excellent Daughters, which is about feminism in the Middle East. It's Fascinating. I loved it. Um, I have just started a book called um, Golden Gulag, which is about uh, the prison system here in California. So um, just trying to educate myself, um, given all of um, the current event and issues um, in our community and throughout the nation. Um, but I hope that's helpful. Um, I've been on the commission since the fall, so I'm still a relatively new member. Um, but very happy to be here and um, looking forward to serving with all of you. Great. Okay. Thank, thank you, Lindsay. Tricia? Well, thank you very much. Really nice to hear a little bit more about all of you. Um, I have been a lifelong library goer. I am lover. I was raised in a library with my, going to the library with my brothers and sisters, and I worked in the library all through college, UCSB. And, um, and law school, and um, I raised my kid in the library. So I've been, I've been going to the library my whole life. I love it. I really see the values of libraries. And I retired from state service seven years ago and moved to Santa Cruz, and my first stop was the library. And I was instrumental in founding the Friends of the Aptos Library to help with Measure S. So that was fantastic. And we've been raising money and awareness about libraries ever since. And I'm very happy to be here. I just finished uh, today uh, a book uh, by Isabel Allende called The Long Petal of the Sea, which is a wonderful, wonderful epic adventure about the Spanish Civil War and uh, Pablo Neruda and, and Isabel Allende's great grandfather, who was um, the pr president of Chile um, during the 50s and 60s. So anyway, I would recommend it. Great. Thank you, Tricia. So I'm Bob White, and I uh, I worked as an academic librarian for 34. Bruce. Oh, I'm. You know what? I'm so sorry, Bruce. You're next. Thank you. I'm I'm so little, Bob, that it's <laughs> me. My my humble apology. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I am uh, I'm Bruce Cotter. I'm the representative for District Five. I live up here in Felton with my lovely wife Diane. Um, I am relatively new to the Valley, having moved here ju just a year ago after I retired uh, from a career in the uh, software industry, most recently with Oracle. Um, I first moved to Santa Cruz in 1973 to go to UCSC. Uh, I moved back here in 1980 uh, to raise a family. I was here from 80 to 99. Uh, during that time, I s served for uh, several years on the board of Shakespeare Santa Cruz. I was the president of the board for three years. Uh, in 99, um, I moved to New England, continued to raise a family, uh, was elected to the board of trustees of my local library. It is an elective office in, uh, in New Hampshire. I was terrified I would lose the election. My wife at the time looked at me and said, dear, I'm going to vote for you. That's probably going to be enough. <laughs> uh, she was right. <laughs> um, I served as, uh, as board chair for three years there. I also served on the New Hampshire Library Trustees Association and developed training materials that are used to train all of the, uh, all of the trustees in New Hampshire libraries now. Um, I also presented several times to the New England Library uh, Association. Um, moved out here, as I said, I'm currently the, uh, the vice president of the board of the Friends of the Library. I'm um, also active still in, uh, in Santa Cruz Shakespeare. Uh, 
Uh, you asked me to talk about what I'm reading. As you can see from the wall behind me, it's a dangerous question to ask someone like me. But briefly, right now, I'm in the middle of Shakespeare's Henry VI as part of the War of the Roses program that Santa Cruz Shakespeare is doing. Uh, I'm reading Waverly by Sir Walter Scott as part of a reading group with uh, the um, Dickens Project. And on a lighter note, I just finished Laurie King's Riviera Gold and reread Stranger in a Strange Land. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to serve with all of you this year. Thanks. Great. Thank, thank you, Bruce. Um, so I'm Bob White, and uh, I worked as an academic librarian for 34 years and retired in 2006. Uh, while working at UC Santa Cruz, I had the good fortune and opportunity to participate in the planning and design of two library buildings, the Science and Engineering Library, and also the McHenry Library Edition and Renovation Project. Uh, more recently, uh, I was a member of the, Cap the Ad Hoc Design Committee, of the Capitola Branch Library. I've been a library commissioner on the Library Advisory Commission now, uh, representing Capitola uh, since 2019. Uh, I love to read, and the book that I'm currently reading is Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our, uh, our Own. And the book is by Professor Eddie S. Cloud, Jr., and he's chair and professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. So um, I think that's it. So I think we've introduced ourselves, and... Um, Thank you all for doing that. I think that's going to be, it's a difficult time because it, normally uh, we would be, you know, getting to know each other, you know, in face to face meetings. So I think this is helpful for us to get a little bit idea of our backgrounds or in our interests. So thank you for doing that. The next agenda item is the consent calendar. And um, the item on the calendar is, are, are the minutes from the May 18th, 2020 meeting, mm -hmm. the Library Advisory Commission. Moderator Jones, uh, is there any a public request that this agenda item be pulled from the consent calendar? Chair White, there is no request and there are no comments. Okay, great. Uh, so do we have a, uh, a motion to approve the minutes? I move approval of the minutes. Okay, we have a motion, do we have a second? I second. Okay, Rena has seconded the motion. Um, Clerk Simano Vargas, please read the roll call for a roll call vote. Lindsay Bass. Aye. Bruce Cotter. Aye. Rena Dubin. Aye. Jim Landreth. Aye. Mary Ritma. Aye. Bob White. Aye. And Trisha Wynn. Aye. Okay, the motion passes. And uh, so we've approved those minutes from the last meeting. <clears throat> that takes us to general business. And it's agenda item uh, number seven. And uh, the first item is 7A, and it's the library operational recommendations under COVID-19. It's on pages 10 to 12 in your, in your agenda packet. And, uh, and um, thank you, Bob. I um, just was hoping that you all would give us some uh, uh, advice about the direction we, should, we think we should be going. Um, as Eric had outlined before, we were kind of on track to begin piloting opening the buildings, primarily for computer use and some browsing. And as the COVID situation began to worsen, we started to step back from that. Um, as far as I know, I don't know of a public library in the Bay Area that's open at this time. Eric, do you know of any? Um, so. We, we kind of stepped back and said, uh, what are the greatest needs of our customers that we're not meeting? We did a survey with staff and the thing that they came back with um, clearly was um, they're getting lots of feedback about the loss of computer use 
and computer access. Um, you know, I came to this community four years ago and I thought, wow, this is, you know, 30 minutes from Silicon Valley, um, that there wouldn't be the digital divide here that I was seeing in the Midwest, but it, it's so not true. Um, there are so many people in this community that rely on the public libraries to, um, I would say, do some of the most basic things uh, that society requires of us, you know, um, fill out a financial aid form, do your taxes, download Medicare Part B. Um, there's so many things that society now, do the census, um, that is requiring computers, I'm sorry, sign up for Section 8 housing lists when they open. Um, there's so many fundamental things that require computer hardware, software, it requires uh, internet connections, and it requires skills and assistance often. And so it's a huge component of what we are doing in the library. We think it's fundamental to people's information access that we help people bridge um, uh, the barriers they have in their lives around technology. And so uh, the staff really came back and said, we really want to think about how we can improve tech access while we're in this situation. I do want to point out, we put some of our uh, usage numbers in, so you can see, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours of PC usage, Wi-Fi usage. Interestingly enough, and I think people are really unaware of this, is I call us the printer to the stars, but um, a lot of people in their modern day tech setups haven't included printing, and every once in a while you need to. We do charge for printing in the libraries, but you would be shocked at the number of people that come into the libraries to physically print. We have more and more people relying on this as their internet access, and this makes printing relatively difficult unless you come to the library where we can do it wirelessly. So I think um, the library staff did a scan and began to talk about a series of ideas of um, directions we thought we could go in. And I'm gonna let Eric sort of walk through some of these ideas. Some of them are simpler, some of them are more complex. And I would love to get your feedback um, or other ideas um, about ki the kinds of things we could do to improve our services during this really difficult time. Eric? Hi, thanks Susan. All of this, of course, comes with that big caveat that we don't know what the numbers might force um, the health officer um, to, to, to change the current orders and what that may look like for us and other organizations. But there, regardless of those orders, there are some things that we believe we can do to continue to help bridge this divide. Um, there are some from kind of, I don't want to call them simple, but um, we can, we are expanding the reach of our Wi-Fi from our branches. And so we'll do a campaign around that to inform the public that they can, um, they can access for free um, our Wi-Fi um, at the branches. And then um, we'll also, um, in probably beginning in September, we'll figure out a route um, to reach areas that are really geographically closed off um, so that we can send the bookmobile there and then provide hotspots um, and, and provide that Wi-Fi um, there as well. In addition to that, um, and along with the whole curbside model, there's an app that we have and it's available so that if you need uh, to do a print job, um, you can send your print job to one of our branches and, um, and then we will um, print that out for you and you can pick it up just as you would a book um, and it'll be free. Um, we're going to pilot that because that, that kind of changes up our model a little bit and how we distribute items inside and how we have to add one extra step um, and it's already a very efficient system. Um, so all of these um, that require staff time or, or labor, I should say, really um, inside the curbside, we'll pilot it first um, at a few branches and see how it works and then we'll expand it to the other locations that we have running right now. Uh, and hopefully we can continue running that curbside. Hopefully that the numbers um, and the, the orders don't affect that operation, but that is always a possibility. At the very least, the Wi-Fi would regardless um, stay on um, and we'll continue to expand that. Um, and I think we could probably still do the same for the bookmobile as well. Um, so that's one, one step um, that we'll, we'll begin to expand on. 
and then additionally, um, we, we also recognize the hardware need. And so we're going to attack that in a couple of different ways. One, um, we're, we're gonna explore, again, we're gonna pilot this at one of the locations um, using a outdoor kind of internet cafe um, model so that people will be outside uh, where we know you have a 20 times greater risk if you're inside a building. Um, and then the, the um, computers will be spaced out. Um, and um, we're looking at some really innovative ways of, of managing this so that we're not really interacting with the patrons and the patrons don't have to interact with staff and the patrons are staying safe, um, safely distanced from the other patrons who are, who are utilizing the outdoor um, internet cafe. In addition to that, um, we'll also begin to lend out um, Chromebooks. And um, we're, we're, that'll be part of the curbside um, service as well. And just as with the printing, we'll pilot that at a few of the locations first and see how that works um, so that we can lend those out. Um, we're looking at potentially a three week checkout period. And the difference between the Chromebooks, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Chromebooks versus the Internet Cafe, the Internet Cafe has like a, a Microsoft suite on it which is what most of our patrons are used to. Um, the Chromebooks do not. Um, and so there's a little bit of a learning curve and then that'll also put on a demand to our Telinfo services. Um, our Telinfo services uh, has really, they've gone through, uh, there's a high demand on the, on the individuals who answer their phones. Um, I, I'm blanking now on the percentage increase compared to last year, but- 70%. <laughs> thank you. And so, um, that's because they are helping people understand how to utilize curbside, but they're also um, helping people uh, download ebooks now and um, take advantage of our, our Zoom meetings and our Zoom programs. Um, they'll be doing the same, we imagine, with assisting people um, using the Chromebooks that we lend out as well. Um, ebooks, by the way, have gone up 45% um, since this time last year. So. Um, we're, we, we are seeing a demand, a steady increase in, in the demand for these digital resources, and I, it'll be the same for the hardware as well. Um, in addition to that, um, we um, will lend out Fire tablets as well. Um, we have already been lending out computers to shelters and to the hotels um, that have um, quarantined people who are unhoused. Um, and we're going to continue to build on that through our partners. Um, so that's something that we will continue and expand on. Um, and, um, and then the, the last piece of this is something that we are going to really continue to explore. And this is where I think one of the, the other big needs are, and we have to be innovative in figuring out how we're going to help with this. And um, uh, Trisha, you, you referenced or you, you mentioned this at the beginning, um, the, the, the challenges that so many of these families are going to have. Um, because if you remember, when we first did the shelter in place, just about everybody sheltered in place. So it was a struggle for parents like me and others who were home with their kids trying to, to work with them. But now all of us or most of us are going back to work and the kids will be home um, and, and, and learning virtually. And so we're all trying to figure out how this is going to work. Um, and see how we can assist with them. And so it's a big question, but we know there's a big need there. Um, and we know that ta that Telinfo service, which um, Susan just mentioned is up, up over 70%, that's gonna be um, relied on more. And so to respond to the, all of these needs I just mentioned, we're, we're training staff, um, more staff um, that we have who hadn't before helped out with Telinfo. And, and, and put plugging them in into that arena, um, or we will be plugging them into that arena once we have them trained up more. Um, and so that's one need um, that we can um, work on to address, but the needs are gonna be vast. And um, we're, we're trying to have a conversation um, with the schools on this. Um, we've, we've increased e-collections. We're piloting some programs there as well. Um, so that we can get them um, a kind of a curated list of items. Uh, we mentioned the, um, the digital um, concierge service um, that, that we're offering as well to teachers to help support teachers through this. Um, and um, I, I wanna stop there in case there, we, I have questions. Um, but a lot of this is, we're really gonna be doing a heavy needs assessment and trying to, to brainstorm around how we can support these, these needs. Just, 
I just want to say um, a lot of what we're doing is limited by staff. Um, in the short run, we're looking at just maintaining the five locations um, and not expanding them, but we will have to expand into Capitola and La Selva Beach before the end of next year. Um, and so that just puts more and more pressure on the staff. Um, I do want to say that um, we have a lot of training to do with staff. Um, and we also have a lot of union issues that we want to work through. Um, in particular, after you've asked cuts to make significant cuts to pay, it's really hard to place volunteers in the organization. You have to do it carefully and really demonstrate that it's not taking a away the work of a paid employee. Mm -hmm. um, but I do hope that at some point in the next year, we'll be able to pull volunteers and volunteer skills back into the organization. Mm -hmm. I think had a question and then then Rena. Well, um, you know, the numbers are startling, how many people access the computers. I go to the library all the time, so I see the computers are full and people are relying on it. I never go to the library anymore that there aren't people sitting in the parking lot accessing the Wi-Fi. So, I mean, I really want to applaud you for that. Um, and Susan, you started this by saying you were hoping for some direction. And I, I mean, I liked what you wrote in, you know, in, in this report and that you're going to try and get some products into circulation, some tablets, which I think will go a long way. And I like the hot spots. I mean, I, I really just like what you're doing. So when you said you're looking for some direction, is it that you would like us to well, say yes, so, please? Um, yes, but one of the things you said to me that's useful, I mean, we feel like the K-12 piece is a really important part. So it's great to hear you say that you think the great K-12 part is important. Mm -hmm. And not that there's winners or losers this year, but higher priorities and lower priorities are going to constantly be a discussion. Mm -hmm. So I think until we can begin to open the building, the area we're going to focus on is technology. And I, I think a sub-focus within that, though, is K-12 support. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I just uh, one plug for an upcoming program. Part of this community resilience um, series that we have. We have one that's coming up with the Friends um, at the end of July. Um, and then there's also one, since we're talking about schools, coming up on uh, August 28th, which is a Friday. It'll be um, um, with the county um, superintendent. And um, we're going to look at resilience in, in families. Um, we're looking to have a child psychologist and a teen psychologist also to talk about um, resilience um, there as well. And I, and I just, I have to kind of underline like where there, these needs are gonna be so vast um, and we're really gonna to have to be very innovative. Um, so we're looking for ideas on how we can help families manage um, these, these giant challenges that they're gonna be facing um, and the teachers, the, the, the teachers will be facing as well uh, during this digital divide. And, I, and, and there's really, there's a lot of really fantastic things going on inside our community. There was a great article in the Mercury uh, around um, the local tech um, firms in, in, in our county as an example to other counties, how they got together um, to try to assist the schools um, during this last spring. Um, so we should be proud that um, there are people, there are leaders in our, in our community who are um, helping to, to try to figure these things out, but it really is gonna take everyone um, putting their, 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 their heads together uh, to try to figure out how to solve some of these, these really huge challenges. Rena, you also, you also raised your hand. Yes. Um, I do want to thank you about the printing. I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks for trying. And, you know, we, I guess we can see how it goes, but I'm really grateful. And um, I think it will be a huge, it will mean a lot to a lot of people. Um, I'm curious about the Wi-Fi, if it's 24-7 that you want to, and at all the branches, even the ones that are closed, if that's, because I think that would be really important to boost the Wi-Fi everywhere as much as we can. So, um, it's not, rec we're not recommending it, we're, we're recommending it the five that have um, parking lots. Okay. And so, we have in particular pushback at Boulder Creek and at Garfield Park. 
a little bit at Branch of 40 because there really isn't an appropriate space for people to compute there and it becomes a campground. And so we get a lot of pushback from the community. Part of what our goal though is with the five is um, they all have private parking lots, which I think helps take mm -hmm. pressure off the neighborhoods. Um, but we'd like to um, sort of uh, brand the spots with like flags and things and actually encourage more use, not less use to help um, manage some of the, the problems that happen to an, at two in the morning. But we would like to keep them open 24 hours a day um, because there are a lot of people that show up at uh, two in the morning to write a term paper. Yes. Um, and so we wanna kind of honor that. We also are gonna have to work with our law enforcement. And um, you know, at some site it's, sites, actually it's gone on at Aptos for a long time and works mm -hmm. pretty well there and hasn't bothered the community too much, but we've had, especially the, the branches that didn't have appropriate parking areas, it became problematic and the neighbors complained. So we're gonna focus on the five. Okay. But we'll okay. bring well, that. We'll brand them and advertise. Good. <laughs> and I like the 24 seven. I think it's really important or at least midnight to, you know, close midnight yeah. to six, but people are doing all sorts of weird hours and need access. And the people that need access, you know, at 11 PM, they just do. So I think it's really important. Um, I'm also, I love the outside computer idea. Um, I know it would be really, hard <laughs> to implement, but I think it would be really, really useful uh, for people, the more you can do that, even if it's not as a tech support, but just to have a computer. Um, I am concerned about the Chromebooks. Um, I'm curious who it's targeting the Chromebook checkout as a Chromebook user. They're not entirely useful. They're useful for papers and for Google Docs and things like that, but Zoom is terrible. <laughs> and um, so I just, if, it's, if it comes to tech support that I'm hearing you say that just having tech support for the Chromebooks versus, um, you know, maybe other services, I'm, I'm just curious who is targeting because I know the schools are really trying to make sure that everyone has at least a Chromebook for all of their students. So we have, our, our model had been checking out laptops within the building and the laptops are cost about $1,200 a piece, but they have the full Microsoft Office suite. And we have really strict rules for lending because we don't want to lose the money. And I think we had long conversations about um, if that limits access to some of the people who need it most. The great things about the Chromebooks are um, they're $200. And um, so losing some or breaking some is less of a problem. I think, and honestly, this paper just keeps getting rewritten. So one of the things we're getting feedback is, you do some Chromebooks, but don't do that many <laughs> Chromebooks. Um, one of the things we heard was uh, the, so we were kind of doing the laptops for the older folks who are used to the Microsoft Office suite who really want to sit down to a workstation and the Chromebooks for maybe um, uh, the, the younger people, because a lot of younger people now are growing up on Google Docs. And, but it's not bad for some of us older folks to learn all of this too, because I do think Google Docs is probably the wave of the future, the standard of the future. Um, I would say though, um, not every school district offered Chromebooks to their students in the summer. Some of the school districts took the Chromebooks back. And so we had huge swaths of um, young people without any technology all summer long. And so in part, it was to be able to, and again, we're going to be too late for this summer, um, but it is to try to address some of the disparities um, that are going on in the community. Um, I guess my recommendation on the Chromebooks is to really target who it is as a, if there's a way to do that um, as opposed to making it widely available to everybody for checkout. I'm just concerned really for your staff time. So I know the Chromebooks are cheaper and in some ways they're easier to use, but they are more disposable and 
So, you know, it's just kind of as a cost effective thing. It seems really cheap from the outset, but then, you know, how durable are they versus how much staff time it's going to take for problems and all of those things. But if there's targeted places that need it, then you have the classroom um, set up or, you know, maybe a, the schools can kind of facilitate some of the tech support. And I didn't realize they were bad at Zoom, so thank you for that feedback. <laughs> we have, we, have uh, we all are taking turns on our one uh, laptop, and we have Chromebooks, and it did work for my kids who just needed the Google Docs, but now that it's Zoom, it's really, really tricky. So, Interesting. yeah. Thank you. Exactly the kind of yeah. feedback we want. Are there any additional questions for Susan or Eric of Bruce? Yeah, a, a couple of questions related to the K through 12, um, which to me is a really critical area of importance. Um, as a general question, what's the situation with the school libraries? Are they all utterly shut down or are they attempting to provide resources? Um, it well, I, I want to say that it varies dramatically in whether they have libraries or not. Okay. Um, I think uh, the city of Santa Cruz schools have done a pretty good job maintaining librarians and libraries. Um, I've heard uh, varying things about other schools and public and private. Um, I know our library staff stay in touch with um, K-12 librarians. Eric? Yes, um, so I was just going to say or add um, that what we have done um, a fair amount of is working with where they do have librarians, um, getting the kids digital library cards um, so that they can access our resources or we're working um, with some of our vendors to provide them with a curated um, collection, e-collection. Um, so I mean, it's like everything. It's gone. It's gone online, and and mm -hmm. um, the schools really didn't have those kind of resources. Um, so we're we're providing it. Okay. That's money. what I was hoping. It seems like an opportunity to extend your footprint in this K through twelve um, area. The other thing is you you uh, you have said a couple of times recently, Susan, that you are um, pulling back on the virtual programming that that Trisha was coming commenting on earlier. Um, and reevaluating. Um, can you kind of share with us where you are on that? Well, one of the things we realized is um, we didn't have enough staff to do curbside. <laughs> and so um, we had to pull some of the librarian staff in. And the librarian staff have been really um, full of work around programming. So what we're just trying to find is the right balance. I know there's a series of meetings that are going on this week where we're um, pulling key program staff in and just because we haven't done programming like this before. And in some ways it's um, taken longer because you know people like Sarah Jones, um, we're actually teaching some of our performers and vendors how to perform and vend um, using technology. It's just been a lot of work. Um, but we just want to step back and say what's working and what's not working. What's their high demand for? Um, where do we be, need to be going? So one of the things you want to do in, a, in, in children's service normally is have a children's story time um, every day of the week. Um, and usually you spread them across the branches so that if a, if a parent um, wanted to go to a story time, they could find one someplace in Santa Cruz County. Well, if they're digital and if they're recorded, do we need to do that um, every day of the week? It's just, maybe, maybe, um, but um, does it give us new opportunities? So. Thank you. Eric, did you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I, I think what we're, we're doing is we're, um, we're it, we don't want to give the impression that we're stopping programming, but we're, no. um, we're gonna. We're not gonna accept any proposals for new programming, um, and take the time to figure out how are we having an impact on the community. Um, what's the impact we need to be having right now, uh, based on these needs, um, and which what type of programming 
are we providing right now that's meeting meeting some of those needs and 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 uh, um, maybe then review what new programs we we may need to, to offer so i think um sometime around september is when we'll we'll really start to accept the new program proposals based on how we're doing with our staffing and um and then figure out from there uh, what we need to change Trisha? yeah yeah um you know thanks uh eric so much and, and thanks susan um you know so this resiliency program that you have all been working on which is fantastic i am absolutely loving it but you know the friends group offered to do a program in conjunction with you and so it's a week from this coming thursday i think it's going to be awesome and we've tied in canopy so we're encouraging people to go to canopy and read and watch a movie and listen to a panel on race relations so and that was brilliant um, and, and i'm very appreciative of union issues and volunteers not replacing professional staff i completely get it but i wonder if we can very carefully tread into this space where the friends um could step in and and work and do a, you know take the laboring or on some of these programs that you all have started and and just you know for this emergency time i mean it seems like a nice place for us to come together and really support one another and honestly utilize the skills of the community yeah and that's that's very much in our model that we've been trying to nurture through it and, and that i don't think in any way is in opposition to the union um, work because we've, we've had a, for a long time the idea of pursuing a community-based um, program and, and, and that's where you're really meeting the needs of the community because the community is coming to you with their, with, um, their program requests. That said, it still does require staff time even when the community is working on it. So Sarah right now, who's done a, most of these programs for us right now, is, and she's the one coordinating this forum for us here, um, we would still have staff um, in that support role that you wouldn't see um, necessarily out front. Um, but I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, and I don't think it's in conflict with uh, the, the, the union at, at all, because that's, that's part of the library's mission is to work with the community and figure out what their needs are and, and have them drive some of these things. Rena, do you have a question? I, I did. Um, this is something that Bruce uh, asked, which was uh, about the um, libraries closed in the schools. I just want to mention that I know Cabrillo has, they closed their library in the spring, and I'm assuming it will be closed this fall. Um, I know for my kids that was pretty tricky. I don't know if the, um, while I, I think K-12 is the first priority, I don't know if there's uh, needs for Cabrillo students also, um, especially that's a lot of computers that weren't in printing um, that was not available. So, um, and just help, basic help. So I don't know if there's a way to reach out to those, uh, those librarians or the community or um, what's going on with that. I think that's a great idea, Rena. I'll do that. Okay. Any other questions before we move to public comments? All right. So, Moderator Jones, uh, do we have any public comments regarding this agenda item? Chair White, at this time on item A, we do not have public comments. All right. So, we'll bring it back to the Commission. Any additional? comments, questions um, from any of you on the commission? All right. Lindsay. Oh, Lindsay. Hi, I'm just going to say um, I've been listening to all the other uh, questions, but also the information that you all have provided. And I feel like you're on the right track. I think you're prioritizing the right things. I think you guys have been really agile with how you've had to manage um, a lot of uncertainty and a lot of challenge. And I think the staffing constraints um, are going to be really tricky. Um, and, you know, really thinking about how you balance the, uh, like the transition of more of these services online 
um, while not leaving people behind in the process of doing that um, is some that needle that you guys are going to have to thread. Um, and doing that with such a deficit um, in staffing capacity as <laughs> you guys work to meet all these challenges is really tough. So I just wanted to chime in and acknowledge that. Um, and you know, the ability to leverage partners where you can, um, being sensitive to these um, labor components, I think is gonna be absolutely critical. Um, so as you kind of, and I'm super smart to kind of take the pause on virtual programming and really think strategically about, you know, how do we prioritize all of this in light of the fact that we do have um, severe staffing constraints? Because um, that's going to be really important to kind of manage, you know, the the pressure and the challenge on the staffing level. They're dealing with all of these pandemic issues and challenges and stress and, and home life and uncertainty that all of this creates as well. And so, like, keeping your staff, you know, enthused and engaged is, is also important. So I really, you know, respect the fact that you guys are um, being really thoughtful with how you're approaching all of this and just wanted to articulate that. <laughs> you have, you know, lots of support here from the commission and just thank you, thank you, thank you. And please extend those thanks um, to the staff as well for all of that work and thoughtfulness. Thank you. We definitely will extend that. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else? I, I just like to say I, I, I'm so pleased with this because I think there's a lot of innovative approaches here as far as expanding access to Wi-Fi, printing, um, and other services. So I think that's really exciting. And it, it, it's gonna do a lot of, hopefully a lot of good here and, and provide increased access to underserved members of our community. Um, who maybe don't have access to a computer at home or the internet or Wi-Fi. So I think that that's really, really great. So, Susan, are you looking for a motion of support, endorsement? I think it would be great if you could endorse the approach we're taking towards operational services during COVID-19. So, do we have a motion to um, support the services as described in the, um, the agenda item? I would love to make that motion. Yeah. Okay, Rita has moved it. Do we have a second? Bruce. Chris. Second by Bruce. And uh, I have a question. Yes. So I would be very comfortable endorsing and supporting the approach, but I would love to provide the flexibility on the numbers just because Rena pointed out that maybe we don't want to invest so heavily in Chromebooks. Uh, and maybe we ought to go to, you know, tablets or whatever. So I, I'm supportive of the motion, but I would love to make sure that we're giving Susan and Eric the flexibility they need. And to clarify, so that it would be to approve the approach provided in the, um, the, the document um, rather than the services themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We could just say the conceptual approach maybe. So, Rena, you, have, you, have you moved that we approve that? Yes. Yes. Do we have a second? Second. Bruce, Bruce seconds it. Um, all right. So, uh, Clerk uh, Sumano Vargas, please read the roll call for a vote. Lindsay Bass. Aye. Bruce Cotter. Aye. Rena Dubin. Jim Landreth. Aye. Mary Ripma. Aye. Bob White. Aye. And Trisha Wynn. Aye. All right, it's unanimous, the motion passes. And we're off to the, um, on to the next um, agenda item, which is library facilities. And it's on pages uh, 13 through 19 in your agenda packet. Susan. The Santa Cruz Public Libraries operates under one of the most complex governance structures in the state of California. 
Um, the library um, basic governance structure is a joint powers board that consists of the four chief administrators of the cities of Capitola, Scotts Valley, Santa Cruz, and the county administrator. For them to make decisions, almost all of their decisions require unanimous decision making. Um, while that is complex, how the facilities are being handled is more so. Um, at the time that Measure S was passed, it was decided, the four jurisdictions decided together, that the money would be divided between the four jurisdictions and not the Joint Powers Board. So each of the jurisdiction has their own money to spend on their own library as they envision it. The library, the library director plays the role as advisor to this, but that is simply it. So for the Capitola Library to be built, the Capitola City Council had to come to an agreement and a process um, to design and, and build that building. Um, the county does most of the buildings. The city is doing, the city of Santa Cruz is doing their three buildings. Scotts Valley takes care of its own building. Um, whether that is a good <laughs> structure to make decisions or not um, will we'll be written. Um, but in the short run, what I want to say to you is I am reviewing these facilities um, uh, projects to you not because I necessarily control the direction that they go or you necessarily control the direction they go. Um, it's that the decisions that these jurisdictions are made, making will have an impact on the system as a whole and on its operations. Um, so I just wanted to do some quick updates. Um, Aptos, we've actually made lots of progress on the facilities during COVID. Um, Aptos uh, is a county project. They have a, a group design. Um, there are two members of the Friends on the design group. Um, they are going to do a design build project, meaning you hire a contractor who then hires an architect. Um, and uh, there was this very lengthy selection process but they are selecting, or the, the committee is recommending Anderson Brule, architects, very well-known library architect firm, and Bogard Construction, which is a local construction company. I think um, the committee was in full agreement that that was the group that they wanted to select. Um, they will be tearing down the old building and building an entire new branch of about 11,000 square feet. Um, Construction should begin in the summer of 2021 and um, be complete by the end of 2022. Um, should be a beautiful library, very excited. Boulder Creek um, is a small remodel of three areas within the building. We bid it out, it came back too high. We're gonna bid it out again in the next couple weeks. It should open next year. Grants of 40 and Garfield Park um, are in the process of developing the construction documents and getting all the permits. Um, the design has been set, the funding has been found. Um, they should both close by the end of this fiscal year, or this, sorry, this calendar year by December, and um, will open um, in 2022. Capitola had hit uh, a rock in the road um, over some power lines, but they're moving forward. It's going more slowly than we had hoped, but I did include a picture, another beautiful building. This is a Nolan Tam architect building. Um, we expect the grand opening to be early 2021. Um, downtown, which we're gonna go into, so I'll wait on that. Felton, we're just closing out. We'll get you all up there if you haven't been. We've talked about Garfield. La Selva Beach, we just got a $100,000 gift from the Friends of the Library. We're gonna add a, a glass nano door to um, create a separation space between 
children and adults. It's going to delay the project by a couple months, but I think it's the right decision to do and we'll open early next year. Um, Live Oak, the old building, um, we're just going to do a refresh on the children's area and we're hoping to do that starting this fall um, while the building remains open. Um, the Live Oak Annex, which I also want to talk about, we'll hold on for a second. Um, Scotts Valley was done I think now seven years ago. Um, beautiful branch. It was done with a really low budget. There's some things that just need to be um, repaired and some infrastructure that needs to be replaced. And the city of Scotts Valley is moving forward getting um, a lot of those contracts signed. So we're excited. Um, we could spend two hours on the downtown library. Um, the community has been really um, in disagreement about the approach to downtown. I would say that I think at the bottom line, it's financial, $27 million um, is not enough to fix or create a 44,000 square foot library. And so um, uh, there's probably been, I think, five studies on the downtown library now. Um, and the city council just approved a multi-use building with the library on the ground floor. I'm sorry, at least 50 low-income housing units um, above and uh, about 400 parking spots within. And that would be on Lincoln and Cathcart lot four. Um, the subcommittee of the city council that endorsed this liked this approach. Um, it really is an L-shaped library. Um, I think what was attractive about it is libraries are a bit like retail and street frontage on, um, on a street like Cathcart um, is very attractive space which draws a lot of people into the building. Um, although uh, it's the L-shaped, what it allows, the L allows you to do is create a children's wing and an adult's wing, and you can open and staff and close them and staff them for different hours. Um, normally, that's not probably something everybody would want, I think, in an urban area with a large population experiencing homelessness. It actually will create um, some measure of safety and security for some of the parents um, that will be using the downtown library. This is about 35,000 square feet. Um, it sells the air rights um, for between three to $9 million to a developer for housing. Um, the uh, number seven is the community meeting space, which would be right on a major corner in downtown, which I love the thought of classroom teaching going on in the evening as people wander by. Um, um, some people like this proposal better because actually the um, housing is on top of the library rather than the garage and the garage is to the side. Um, and then the next thing I wanted to show you was the annex. I think not a lot of people are aware of the annex. It was something that was approved as part of Measure S. Um, when we built the Live Oak Library, the really disappointing piece, you know, such a beautiful piece of property, but we weren't able to put any program rooms, study rooms into that facility. Um, and we we asked to add some later, and they still won't let us do it because of parking limitations. And it's on the coast, so the Coastal Commission was heavily involved in those choices. What's hard about um, that is it doesn't make the Live Oak library, a 21st century library, in terms of creating active learning spaces for community groups to gather and learn. Um, John Leopold, who's the supervisor from this area, really wanted to create uh, community learning spaces. And so he got a portion of the Measure S funds um, for an annex. And we searched for about a year and a half about where to put it and decided that the best partnership would be the, with the Simpkins Swim Center. They have a um, large meeting area within the Simpkins Swim Center 
that is incredibly underutilized. Um, and so what this do does is create, um, it reutilizes that large uh, meeting area so that uh, we can partner in its use and do more learning activities in that space and adds a uh, smaller library space, small study rooms, some technology and a classroom. What's great about the, the Simcoe Swim Center site is it's uh, located next to a junior high school, um, close to an elementary school, next to the Boy and Girls Club, uh, community soccer field, and on the rail bike trail. And so we do really see this potentially as um, a community gathering space um, where we'll do learning programs. Um, this is being developed as a partnership between Parks and Rec at the county and the library with the primary staffing coming from um, Parks and Rec in terms of the day-to-day -day supervision of the space, um, but a lot of the programming coming out of the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. And I do want to say this in part um, funds some exterior spaces so that there could become a big plaza uh, outside of the Simpkins Swim Center between that and the Boys and Girls Club that could be used for community events. Um, you know, imagine food trucks and bands and uh, a Japanese fair um, and sort of bringing that. Um, Abbott Square type of space to Mid-County. Um, one thing that's special about Mid-County is a lot of our native Spanish speakers live in that community and go to those schools. And so I think there's some really specific programming needs uh, for those families um, that we'd love to work um, with Parks and Rec to address. And again, uh, I think the big concern about the annex is operational costs. For me, the big concern about downtown is, um, we can have a longer discussion about this, but um, we're not allowed to call, uh, and I've specifically been told, I'm not allowed to call the downtown library the central branch. Um, each jurisdiction feels uh, ownership over their own branches and not necessarily ownership over each other's. And it's very difficult to run a system of this size without a warehouse of books, honestly. Um, it's a cost-effective way of providing books to the public, even with a hold system. Um, the size of the downtown branch is important um, because it will play that role um, as the warehouse of books that feeds all the holds of all the other branches. And um, my hope had been originally that the downtown branch library would be more like 44,000 square feet. Um, with the multi-use, we believe we can get 35,000. If we were going to remodel, it would have gone to 30,000. And I, I worry about the impact of that on programs and services um, for all of the branches. And I, I do think that um, the health of the downtown library in some way plays a role in the health of all the branches. So, do you have any questions? Serena. Um, I'm just curious about the annex, and um, I'm just wondering if you could have Wi Fi um, available there now. Um, or so, it just is such an important space. So, um, we're developing our um, MOU, and I'm going to ask that question. So, the interesting thing is, we're on a different technology framework than the county, um, but I think the county is going to agree to let us put up our Wi-Fi on our networks. Um, and we agreed that we would put it up for the whole complex uh, so that, you know, someone could play with their computer at, at the pool side. Um, but you're asking whether we could do it right now. Right now, because it has such a huge parking lot, and if it if it broadcasts to that whole area, I think um, you would get a lot of kids. There's so many. There's the, the schools, as you mentioned, just that whole area. There's a lot of denser um, housing over there. That I think if people knew that that they could just go and sit on I, their devices for free, I think it would make a really big difference. 
I, um, I have to check where the fiber is because it costs to bring fiber. I think it's on the other side of the railroad track, but we're going to have to bring it anyway. Right. Um, so I think it's a great idea, Rena. We'll look into it. Okay. Any other questions for uh, Lindsay? On the annex, Susan, you said that you had concerns around operational costs. Could you expound on that? Well, uh, so we've lost about 36% of our staffing. Um, a parks and Rec um, is going through their budget reductions right now. And so um, it's hard to grow an additional site when you're um, not fully covering the cost of your current operations. And um, have the friends groups um, ever provided like um, grants for operational costs like that in the past? Yeah. Um, Lindsay, traditionally the friends groups have been focusing on enhancements not operations. Um, so sometimes there's a very fine line. I'm just thinking these are unprecedented times, right? right? And just curious if there's any opportunity where you see kind of these um, pinch points um, to leverage them and their support. I think we've had more success with grants for operations, um, mm -hmm. but they usually have additional requirements. Right. Um, and it's been very difficult. I think we've been very successful lately in getting um, uh, grants for facilities. But again, that's, people tend to like that. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. Okay, but it is unprecedented. You, <laughs> you have a question? I do, it's also tricky because the Friends is organized in chapters, and there's no chapter for, for Live Oak. And um, so it's the it's a little bit um, harder to raise funds for 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 that area that that branch. So, um, Lindsay, I have two people that are interested in um, creating a chapter. Um, you're in Live Oak, right? Can I give yes, them your name? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I'll do that. That would be great. I don't want to overwhelm you, but I think just having some broad support to, to kick off a chapter would be helpful. All right. Any other comments before we move to public comments? So, Moderator Jones, do we have any public comments regarding this agenda item? Chair White, we do have three comments. The first one is the one that I read previously, but I will read reread for the record. It says there is an error in the library director's report on library facilities found on page 14 of the agenda packet. In her report on the downtown branch, she states in part, quote, downtown group four completed a cost assessment and preliminary design of the downtown library as part of a mixed use project within the existing $27 million budget. Findings were presented to the city council on June 23rd, 2020. The council conceptually approved relocating the downtown branch to the ground level of a mix, mixed use project on lot four to include at least 50 affordable housing units and a parking garage, end quote. The motion passed by the city council was to include a minimum of 50, quote unquote, low income housing units, not, quote unquote, affordable units. There is a big difference between the two. Low income has a specific definition provided by the federal government's housing and urban development agency. The income level for low income is very different and much less than that of quote unquote affordable units. And I would be happy to make that change to the board packet. The next comment, based on the library's librarian's creative responses to the current closure of facilities, it would seem that this proves that a closure of the downtown branch for renovation would be less of a hardship than feared. You may or may not know that there was a pop-up demonstration, quote unquote, a month ago, June 17th, to keep the library where it is. Some 50 to 60 people showed up. Your next comment. 
There was a little bit of confusion around this next comment and I assured the commenter that I would read it. I think the library should have a full report on all school libraries and librarians or other staff for all schools countywide so the library system has information and does not have to guess on the needs of children. Moderator Jones, is that referred to the previous agenda item? It is, but there was some confusion around the comment, and so I assured them that I would read it for the record. All right, thank you. And then your next comment, 47B, the Live Oak Annex is an 11th branch. How are we going to provide adequate operational costs with yet another branch? And then the final comment was not timely received. All right. Thank you for those comments. Um, I, I, I just, maybe it helps um, with that one, if I could, with that one individual asking about the, the report. I, we do have a team of, of staff who connect on a regular basis with the schools. So it's, it's not a question of um, figuring out what's going on with them, but it's just, it's just trying to figure out how to deal with this new challenge. Everyone, including the schools and the teachers and the families and the um, the administrators for these schools are all trying to, to figure out how, how we can address these needs and, and understand them better. Um, and so it is still going to require all of us to put our heads together um, and, and, and figure this out. But we do, um, on a regular basis, meet with the schools. Um, I, I don't have all that information on, on hand, but our, our team does, um, and, and they're, they're always working on this. Okay. Thank you. So this was a, basically a report. Were you looking for any action on our part, Susan? Uh, I think this is um, important background as we move forward. Okay, well, well thank you for the update. I, I think it's very impressive what's happening uh, library-wide in, in our county. I mean, uh, new buildings, uh, remodeled buildings, refurbished buildings. I, I think it's quite impressive, all the activity that has taken place and, and what's being accomplished. I, th I think it's really impressive. And I just want to thank um, the taxpayers who passed Measure S um, and all the people that worked to make it pass. Um, we're going to be so proud of this library system in the few years. Just, it's going to be magnificent. Okay, well, well thank you for the report. I think it was really, uh, it was comprehensive, so thank you. Well, that brings us basically to the end of our meeting, I think. Um, we have our next meeting in September. Um, for sure, we'll, we'll have a budget update. And I'm sure we will also have to do a, a progress update just because things are so ever evolving. Are there other things that you would like us to address at the next meeting? Any ideas, thoughts? If you think of anything, you can always email it to me. I do have one thought. Um, for, for now and also in September, I would love to know what you want us to do. Like if there's ways that we can um, uh, ideas that, that of things that you're doing now that we should be pushing out um, just into our networks as part of a public service, um, certain things that, that the library wants to be promoting uh, services that are being, um, that are happening at this crazy time. So I think uh, just kind of getting more clear that you have all of us, we all care, so how we can be helpful just in disseminating that information. I will be more specific about that. Thank you. Great. Any other suggestions for topics or agenda items for our next meeting? I would just love a, an update on um, how you guys are prioritizing across um, the online services, virtual programming, curbside services, um, and just a sense of you know how you're doing that prioritization and then the progress would be great thank you all 
Okay, anyone else? If you do think of something, yes, Bruce. Can I make just a general comment? Yes. Okay, Susan, I hear what you said about being proud of the library in the future. I think there's a lot to be proud of about this library right now, and especially how this group of staff has risen to the occasion in really, really difficult times. So just so you're clear, I couldn't be prouder of you guys. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, my bad. You're right. I. I am so privileged to work with a group of people I work with. They, they, they're so mission driven. They, they care deeply about what this organization does. And um, it's, it's a joy even in the hardest times. I think it's pretty amazing what you've done uh, during this, this time period uh, as far as extending library services. And uh, so bravo. Thank you. Indeed. And I will let the staff know. Oh, okay. let us know if we can do the pizza thing. I know. Oh, so if there's some way that we could do that, I, believe me, I would step up to a few pizzas. I'd be happy to. Okay. Can I say something? Trisha? Yes. Well, so I sit on the board of Second Harvest and, you know, they have been, that staff has been working unbelievably hard for four months and the board took up a collection and we bought them all burritos and sodas last week, just as a, you know, just as a kind of a staff appreciation. And boy, was it meaningful. It was quite meaningful and it was a burrito. So, I mean, there are lots of ways we could reward staff um, and we should think about it. Even if we got them an ice cream cone. I mean, you know, you're, there, there are just our ways to show the staff that you appreciate them. And I would, I'm with Bruce. I'd go along with that. Thank you. I will do that. Burritos, individually wrapped. Or sandwiches, again, individually wrapped. I mean, let us know. This town has awesome burritos, though. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank so, you. It, again, if you have any additional thoughts, please forward them to Susan. And that will, will, be, will be helpful in formulating and uh, putting together the next agenda for our, our September meeting. Um, actually, if you want to do something that I would like is, um, I would love for you to do um, curbside. I know that several of you have, but it'd be great to do a hold and do curbside and let us know how it went. Thank you. Okay. So that's, I think that does bring us to uh, adjournment. And uh, we're, so we're adjourned until the next regular meeting the Library Advisory Commission to be held on Monday, September 21st, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom teleconference. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening and uh, take and care. And thank you for all the book thank recommendations. You. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye everybody. This adjourns the Library Advisory Commission meeting for July 20th, 2020. Take care, everyone.